in Kiki's Loft, there was always a wonderful suggestion of what we can't see that I really enjoyed playing with. This place is huge. There are giant sheets of, uh, I think it's called Visqueen. It's like a waterproofing plastic that are literally tacked up for no logical reason except, why is that there? <laughs> it's, it's part of this discomfort idea, this feeling that there are things in every shot you will never get an answer to. That was part of what was driving a lot of the decisions behind the look of After Hours. But we loved this idea of sometimes you could see light coming from that room or people leaning in that doorway. One of the remarkable things about Michael Ballhaus's approach to lighting is that he had a kind of low-budget filmmaker's eyes, and he would see how close the lighting already was to what it needs to be, and all we need to do is reinforce from this side, or all we need to do is bring a little something here to fill in the shadow. It was an unusual approach that respected what's already there. All right, hurry up. For a little while, Michael Balhas and I just kept getting hired as a team. Uh, first of all, a little tiny movie showed up in New York City with a German director, and they were looking for a cheap production designer, and the cinematographer was Michael Balhas. It was his first time in the U.S. filming something. And Michael and I then did Baby It's You for John Sayles and Amy and Griffin. We had worked on Reckless together for James Foley. I think the real draw for Marty was that Michael had a way of working that was so fast and actor-centric and his need for invention that supports the emotional quality of each moment. Marty needed a costume designer for After Hours. I went and met Marty and I thought he was very funny and very approachable and that I wouldn't get the job, and then several weeks passed, and I did get it. It couldn't have been a more perfect project for me to start with. But I was very enthusiastic. I'm very interested in characters. And I see costume design almost as writing. It's interpretive. Marty had final approval of everything, and we did many of the fittings with the principal characters in his loft. And Rosanna would come over, and we'd talk about Rosanna's character, and talk about what worked, what had the most meaning for the character. Some of them were dressed in their own clothes, like John Hurd. But we managed to get enough detail in so that everybody was distinct. And I, I, I think it created the right mood for that script. Okay, let's, first of all, refresh the screen here. All right, and go in a format roller. Paul is in that khaki suit, which blends into the background. So we don't really know who he is, except that he's a disaffected word processor, and he's bored with his job, and he wants some adventure. When Paul is in the taxi, the cab driver just has a ball cap on with a patch on the front that says, Captain, and that makes me think the ferryman to Hades is the captain of the rowboat. And that's where they're going to a very hellish night for Paul. When he gets downtown, he's disoriented and, you know, it's like hell, empty, dark. So it's a black shirt for Paul. Welcome to our world. Put this on. Put this on while you're waiting. Thanks. When we first see Kiki, the sculptor of the bagel and cream cheese paperweights, she's working on her statue and she's wearing a sexy bra and a tight little punky skirt. And story about the bra. Marty had to approve it. And Marty I said, will you come shopping with me? And I was in Trash and Vaudeville on St. Mark's. I thought we would probably meet at the fitting room at the back of the store, but Marty walks in the store, and Linda, Kiki, is right there. <laughs> and he really did a double take. <laughs> you know, oh, my God. Um, I like the bra. I was having a wonderful time, just making discoveries downtown. Horst and the black leather tank top and 
harness and bracelets, the disciplinarian. Just a guy? Yeah. I went to the factories that made that bondage clothing that were down by the river. I'm horsed. There was stuff that I got at the Leather Man, which was where the chaps and hats came from. Can you say, after all, it wasn't your fault? Hello again. Sorry about this, I was detained. Marcy's little white dress and that white jacket, which came from my closet, <laughs> as did many of the costume pieces in the show. She looks kind of angelic. She looks like a girl who, she could be a student, she could have a nice job in an office, but she doesn't seem to be a threat. I guess white has a lot of emotional value and it's virginal. In some cultures, it means death. When I look at the movie now and see what she's wearing, it looks as if there's a lot of thinking behind it. But I don't really think I was thinking of that at the time. I think we saw it on her and said, oh, okay, okay. that makes sense. When she is wearing her white dress, there's a tiny little clue. It was a belt, a beaded belt from my closet. And the beading said Mohawk Trail. It was one of those souvenir belts. Well, that's where this whole thing is leading him, to Club Berlin and the Mohawk. I don't know if anybody could see that. It was a piece of irony, by accident. I knew there was something special about you. One of the things that I think some people don't understand about After Hours was how tiny the budget was and how much we needed to shoot on a given shooting night. And uh, I'd never designed a film with so few conversations with a director. And so I had a lot of set reveals for the director on the day of shooting, which is unheard of. I could have sworn I thought I heard you say something in here. Well, I didn't. In Marcy's room, we were in a hurry, and I proceeded to tape up random posters in Marcy's room by the corners, and then as violently as I could muster, I'd tear them down so that there were just bits of corners on all the walls. And what I guess I was after was someone had tried to make the room nice, and then something violent happened, and now this is what it looks like. In terms of lighting, Marcy's bedroom had an incredibly simple approach. There was a ceiling fixture, like a warehouse light hanging down from above that we had wrapped in a kind of pink or salmon colored fabric to soften the light and to warm it up a little bit to make it kind of like thrown together romance. Michael had asked if I could have something mysterious glowing underneath the bed. I think we had snuck some fluorescents and wrapped them in, I want to say maybe a teal-colored gel. Mm. Well, here we are. Our property master, Tom Allen, had prepared candles, and there's a special way of making them where you've got like six wicks or something in the center, and the candle's actually putting out a surprising amount of light. It's real. It's actual flame light. The candle light, of course, became extremely important for so many of those scenes because anything occurring once Marcy has taken her life, the candle is really it. And then we put a little night light over by the bag of her belongings with the burn book and the ointment and all that stuff. So it required very little other lighting to get that sort of strange kind of romantic feeling, but creepy at the same time. Psst. Hey, it's me. I did it. I quit my job. When I think about the clothes, I always think of Terry Gar right away, because that was a standout. Julie wore a plastic raincoat, and that was indicated in the script. Joe Minion didn't mention too many things except the clear plastic raincoat, and it was pouring out besides, so it was practical. What do you want me to do about it? Well, let's go have a drink. Let's celebrate. Tier 3 is open. Look, lady, I don't know what your problem is, but I've got to get over to that bar, get my keys, so I can get home. I made the yellow dress. It was just a very simple sheath dress. It was kind of generic for the 60s, if you were a little mod. But the yellow, I'm pretty sure that Jeffrey Townsend and Marty came up with that idea. 
I can get free copies whenever I want to. Gee whiz. Hey, what is that? Gee whiz. I mean, are you humoring me? I don't have to take that kind of shit, you know? I mean, what is it with people today? You can't say anything without getting some kind of a... I remember talking about Alice in Wonderland and how the taxi ride seems to be the white rabbit and the sensation of a kind of skid mark that the taxi leaves on the entire night. And that turned into yellow sort of recurring as a color. Now, first of all, you're not stupid. Look, I have trouble figuring out the tax on checks. So what? There was zero budget for building sets on After Hours, for Julie's apartment, for Tom the bartender's apartment, and for Gail, the Mr. Softy truck driver's apartment. I found a little residential loft that had street windows and then I think two windows on an air shaft on the other side, but it was pretty small. And with my construction coordinator, Tony Dunn, we crafted the design of a set of flats that could be moved and repositioned up against these windows to become three different apartments. You could get outside the apartment and sit and have a conversation and satisfy the sort of claustrophobic issue of trying to work in these tiny spaces. I'm an ice cream vendor, Mr. Softy. What? I... You misunderstood me. I didn't ask what you did for a living. I said... You wouldn't believe what I've been through tonight. It's not boring. The color motif of most of the movie was black and yellow, which represents a New York taxi cabs. And also caution tape, do not cross this line. Gail, Catherine O'Hara, the greatest. A yellow shirt, it was bright yellow, and she had black jeans, and there were a few punk accessories. We put a patch on her sleeve that said King Kong Company, which was an outright reference to Taxi Driver, because Travis Bickle has that on his jacket. But she was very, I mean, she was Mr. Softy Driver, but she was pretty intimidating, <laughs> Griffin. Come on. What's the matter? Shut up. What? Shut up. What's wrong? You're dead, pal. Griffin's suits and all of the gyrations we went through to find that suit and enough multiples of that suit because of the rain and the plaster and the gradual distressing of the suit. I remember being in awe of Rita's handling of the fact that you've got a movie that shoots way out of sequence and you have to have a character in this nasty beige suit in varying stages. And she had these suits that looked permanently wet. They weren't actually wet, but it looked like the suit was currently wet and it was dry as a bone. I was happy to be allowed to draw the shark biting the penis and the bathroom graffiti in a kind of wannabe Keith Haring way. In the script, when it came to Club Berlin, you had this nightclub above a basement and we discovered the main space of Club Berlin. It was just kind of a startling find. It was empty and unused, but it still had a big bar in the center. And there's the basement right there that looked so close to what I had pictured for this basement. The manhole originally in the script was just a window of some kind. And I was walked over toward the street side to say, ah, oh, obviously there's no window because that isn't really a thing. And then I look up and I realize I'm looking at a manhole from the underside. And taking that to Marty was really a whole lot of fun, the idea that those three locations could actually be in one place. It just changes things for the actors. It changes things for shooting. It's such a treat, and it just never happens. It was one of those little kind of halo moments for after hours. Clarence Felder, the bouncer at Club Berlin, wore a Checkpoint Charlie Berlin T-shirt, which obviously referred to the East Germany, West Germany, that belonged to one of the crew members. But it was something that Marty requested, I think. Checkpoint Charlie, and they don't want to let Griffin in. May I enter? I can't let you in at the moment. But we needed a crowd of punk kids for the Mohawk night scene. So on a Sunday, we all went down to CBGB's. 
and we ask the kids, hey, you want to be in a Scorsese movie? And they go, well, would I get, like, paid? And we said, yes, yes. And they all showed up, and they all wore their own clothes. That was our way around having to dress those hundreds of extras. Marty wanted a Russian uniform. He wanted the image of the director controlling the crowd with a spot. It was kind of a last-minute decision. Well, we found a real Russian uniform. Early in the script, there's a reference to plaster of Paris, bagel and cream cheese paperweights. And I remember our art department experimenting with cream cheese in blocks or just smears and the process of trying to get to the right one, the right paperweight. Do you know what this is? No. When it came time to develop the sculpture that Kiki Bridges is working on with paper mache, there is a scripted reference to it reminding Paul of Edvard Munch. So it was one of the things in the movie that got a kind of full-fledged sketch done to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. So I remember working with a sculptor named Nora Chavushin, still a working artist to this day. When Griffin has to carry the statue, I wanted that shape to be interesting to look at. I wanted there to be an interesting way that this thing envelops Griffin, Paul Hackett, that it kind of wraps around him like, like a piggyback but still made sense on its own on the ground as a pose. So I remember visiting her and saying, so can you pick it up? Can you put it on your back? I'm just grateful to have done After Hours. I think we all enjoyed making it. It had punks and Griffin besieged with all these problems. It was a fun movie to make. Just throw down the keys. It's all right, be careful. That's right. Give it a good throw. There you go. 